All right. And you should just be able to see my slides. Yes. And uh, great. Before you start, let me introduce, introduce uh, Javi. So Javi Danto is a current graduate student at Pratt Institute pursuing an MSLIS in library and information science with an advanced certificate in archives. As an information professional, their primary focus has been on organizing physical and digital materials centered in contemporary art, performance, gender, and sexuality. Great. And we're getting started with Lightning Talks 4. Javi, go ahead, right ahead. Hi, I'm Zavi Danto. Um, Sorry about that, Zavi. Oh, no, you're totally good. <laughs> I, I need to part start, you know, having pronunciation guides. But um, yes, good morning, and thank you so much for your introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Zavi Danto. I'm a current MSLIS Pratt, uh, student at Pratt Institute and a recent preservation intern for Rhizome a nonprofit that champions born digital art. Today, I'll discuss the development of shape expressions for Rhizome's digital archive, ArtBase. ArtBase is a wiki-based instance that allows Rhizome to define a flexible data model for born digital art, but there is a need for a guide integrated with Wikibase, reflecting institutional consensus on critical components of how this data is modeled in a user-friendly and easily customizable format. And also I'll just mention this image in the background is generated with RDF shape, which I will mention later. Um, all right, so this is gonna be my presentation roadmap. Um, so this need for a centralized data validation guide has led to an ongoing conversation and research project adapting an existing data entry guide for shape expressions. Shape expressions or SHEX, are defined within the entity schema namespace and Wikibase. They allow data curators to specify patterns for data conformity, ensuring data integrity in contexts like APIs and semantic web applications, including but not limited to Wikibase instances. This framework enhances interoperability and facilitates better data management, supporting data curators and users alike. For Rhizome, 23 entity schemas have been defined for ArtBase, serving as a foundation for various integration goals, including improving manual edit, uh, item editing with generated input forms, providing feedback for item conformity to shape expressions, developing an API for automated checks against shape expressions, generating visual data model representations, and integrating with query interfaces for filtered results. And I'll just note that due to the time constraints of this presentation, I'd encourage you all to review a more detailed guide, which is attached to the abstract on the LD4 website along with this presentation. I can also share a link to this guide in the chat after my presentation as well. All right, so this is gonna be a basic overview of how to write a shape expression, which I will get to shortly. So, when writing shape expression schemas, start by defining appropriate namespaces based on the structures you're checking for. Adding an empty prefix, like prefix colon example, can help troubleshoot some shape label format issues that arise depending on the integration option your organization goes for. So here, the first statement in a schema indicates where the validation should start. While this is not mandatory, it helps navigate the validation issues between integration options as well. Our preferred implementation for validation is Rudolph, which requires that shape labels be formatted with colons rather than brackets, as you can see with the alternative formatting. All right, so shape expressions, similar to any kind of RDF data, rely on node constraints and triple constraints. An RDF triple consists of a subject property and object. Constraints define how information should be expressed and connected, serving as a user-friendly and machine-readable adoption of a metadata application form, uh, profile. And this is gonna be the tabular format of what I just showed you. So this is the checks format, and then this is how I, I would define it as a table or like the different options that are there. So this first column is gonna be a property, which is defined by a p-value um, seen, or which is in art base or the wiki base of your choosing. 
a value, which can be a number of options. Um, most likely you'll just link it to another Q value or an XSD string or an array of defined values. In some cases, this will have to be a reference shape also known as a value shape, which can be further defined in the last column of this tabular format by mimicking the table as seen here. The cardinality specifies how many items can link to a property. The default is going to be one if there is none filled in. And then annotations, and this is less talked about, but it provides a machine readable comment that can be integrated with an API down the line if you want to generate a form from a shape expression. So in this case, we're using RDF comment which will specify user guidance, and then RDF label, which will redefine the label for an API. All right, so shape maps specify how the validation should be carried out. This can be either a Sparkle query known as a query map or a fixed map, which is a one-to-one -one relationship. Due to existing integration challenges, we're currently focusing on fixed maps, which are simpler and provide a clear validation pathway. An example of how this map is formatted for Rudolph is seen in the center of these two options as well. All right, and so here is a little video of how this looks. I'm gonna just pause it. So this is gonna be where your prefixes live. This is where the query map is, if you would like to use one. This is gonna be the start value of the first shape. And then everything else is pretty straightforward, but you can see this is gonna be a reference or value shape that points to this value down here. All right, so our current workflow involves adapting a, you know, existing data entry guide to a shape expression, human readable format. And then I'll look at that with Rudolph in the command line as a checks in JSON format to see how well formed it is and if it's readable. And then also I like looking at it as a visualization using RDF shape. And that'll let me know if this is how I want it to look. And then once I know that this Shex is well-formed, I'll compare it to a good model artwork or artist in the archive. And also maybe a query will like bring all these properties out. And then, this main problem uh, is that Chex only looks at an RDF document. It doesn't look at the second level of what's linked. And so we have a Python script to pull that together. Um, it's still in progress. And I think the relationships can be better refined as well. Um, and then from there, we can make our fixed map and then transfer it to Rudolph to validate, and then further steps will be de determined. So as I mentioned, we prefer using Rudolph, which is the REST implementation for validation due to UX advantages over the simple online validator. Other helpful tools include this MediaWiki configuration if you prefer the simple online validator, VS Code extensions, and the RDF shape site which provides a visual analysis for checks forms amongst other options. All right, so in conclusion, there is still progress to be made, but having each checks adapted from the current data guide is already helpful in providing a more nuanced description of how items should be linked for their implementation is on the near horizon. If you have any advice on how to proceed based on how checks is used in your Wikibase instances, feel free to reach out. And many thanks to the immense support from Rhizome, Dragon Espensheed, Kat Thornton, Andra Wagmeister, and Jose Emilio Labra Gallo. Great. Thanks so much, Zavi. Thank you. 
I am going to pause recording for our next presentation. Okay, thanks, Kelly. I'm going to try to <laughs> successfully share my screen. Let's see. Okay, hopefully you can. Yes, thumbs up. Great. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks for joining today. Um, my talk is called Kenoshing the Connoisseurs, a Comparative Bibliography of Bernard and Mary Berenson. So Bernard and Mary were key figures in art criticism and the art market um, during the first period of their activity together, so 1890 to 1903. Um, both were grappling with questions of connoisseurship and the attribution of artworks. In other words, they were uh, in other words, they were traveling around on what they called kenoshing trips, um, deciding who painted what. Also during this time, they were synthesizing uh, ideas of regional style um, and developing theories about how the uh, act of viewing art affects people. So uh, the rationale for my joint bibliography project uh, is to address the collaborative nature of their work, um, to bring more visibility to Mary, uh, and to engage in feminist art historiography, broadening um, the focus to more like cultures of connoisseurship. Um, and I do have some research questions uh, that I'm hoping to answer uh, around how they signed their work, how they cited each other, um, and kind of just how their, their scholarship relates. I started this project over 10 years ago um, in a graduate course uh, on art history methods. It was just a Word document. Um, and in 2019, I picked it up again as part of a digital humanities course. My involvement in Wikidata postdated that course. Um, so it wasn't really until recently that I thought to encode this bibliography as linked data. Um, I chose Wikidata rather than Wikibase um, since the existing Wikidata properties would cover most of my needs uh, and the data set is rather small. Uh, and I was able to do some work on this during fall of 2023 as part of the WikiEDU Wikidata Salon. So now I'll talk a little bit about my data model. Um, so Bernard and Mary wrote things like books, letters to the editor, reviews, and articles. So to capture some of this, I included properties like review of and uh, published in. Uh, perhaps the most complicated modeling I did was to try to encode the way each author signed their work uh, using qualifiers, and I will get into that a little bit later. Um, the reviewed titles were also of interest to me, and those used more or less the same uh, as the bibliography process. Um, I also created some ad hoc data models, kind of worked as I went. Um, and this was because, as many of you may have experienced, um, sometimes you have to create other items and work on the way. I did have to create people, organizations and publications. Um, for these, I didn't develop detailed data models or took a more minimal approach focused focused on identifiers. Um, I did also uh, wiki data items for periodicals um, based on OCLC and Hathi Trust records, which I then uh, included links to either in the identifiers section um, or as references. Oh, I see that you're having some connection issues. Can you still hear me? Yes, it's, it's just going a little bit in and out. I just wanted to make a notice for anyone. Okay, let me turn my video off. Sorry about that, home internet. Um, okay, let's turn that off. Okay, um, so, right. Uh, the task of creating items for both periodicals and article items led me to reflect on the intersections of bibliography projects like mine um, with institutional library metadata. So um, most of the items at the center of my project uh, required a more granular level of description than what we would typically find um, 
in library metadata. Um, so those article level items, of course, depended uh, on the existence of uh, bibliographic records describing the serial titles and really required that pre-existing description for meaningful interlinking. Uh, so to me, the kind of metadata uh, libraries might donate to Wikidata or even just make open openly available uh, is really a necessary foundation for digital humanities scholars who want to create new data sets um, about scholarly publications. Okay, um, now I'll talk a little bit about the process I followed for creating and updating items. Um, these techniques can be used both for smaller scale projects like mine uh, or by an institution <clears throat> donating their metadata to Wikidata. So uh, I will say the process was very iterative, um, but there was a somewhat linear order of operations. As I mentioned, um, certain items needed to be created before others um, since some statements depended on their existence. So for example, I created author items before uh, creating items for their works and items used in references also needed to be pre-created. So really only toward the bottom of this list do you see the actual items I was most interested in, um, which are the writings by Bernard and Mary and the titles that they reviewed. Um, to create and edit, <clears throat> excuse me, these items, I mostly did it by batch and occasionally by hand. Um, I used OpenRefine uh, and made several schemas based on the data model I defined earlier. Um, and uh, yeah, that was, again, very iterative because I kept forgetting certain properties. Um, I also used quick statements um, sometimes. It kind of depended on my mood and, and how the tools were performing. Um, I did a lot of trying things out and redoing them or trying again. Um, so, for example, I started uh, by adding information about how Mary and Bernard signed their works using a subject named as qualifier on the author statement. Um, it quickly became clear that that was wrong and it should have been an object named as property. Um, so I used quick statements to mix success to delete the author statements and add them back and then add the correct qualifier. Um, I also initially added exactly what I had in my data, which I didn't talk about, but was originally a Zotero um, collection that I exported as a spreadsheet. Um, and so that was things like the text string unsigned if the author didn't sign the piece and unknown if I hadn't seen a copy of it, so couldn't confirm if it was signed or not. Um, later, I changed this to no value and unknown value, which are specific data types in Wikidata. I also chose uh, the wrong instance of value for the books uh, that I created. So long story short, uh, based on Wikiproject books data model for works, um, works should be instances of written work or one of its subclasses. And I think that book was a subclass of written work when I, when I added my uh, items, but then that changed. So I had to adapt. Um, I also did add uh, full work available properties for written works, even though that's not exactly where it should go. It should really um, be on the addition items, but I didn't want to overcomplicate my model by creating both works and additions. Um, I also ran into some quirks of OpenRefine. Um, so if an item had multiple authors, um, that uh, kind of the, let's see, what did I write there? Um, the main reconciled item has to be filled down in OpenRefine. So just little quirks like that. Um, and then a few batch upload failures using quick statements, either for unclear reasons or because I had a very long um, label. So in order to check my work, um, I use Tabernacle, which is typically used for editing in a kind of tabular view, um, but that helped me catch missing data. Um, I know I'm running out of time here. Uh, and I also use Sparkle. So here's some Sparkle uh, queries. And the slides are in the in the um, uh, LD4 sketch. So 
Um, last few things, it was really helpful to get uh, advice and talk to a dedicated group of people and also to have some accountability. So I want to thank the Wikidata Salon group. Um, and I also was able to go to the Wikidata Modeling Days um, conference in 2023 uh, and go to their data modeling clinic. Um, okay, so visualizations, I won't go over those too much. Um, you can look at them later if you want. Um, and, uh, just to take away, I sometimes do ask myself if this is worth it. I, for example, already know that they both reviewed Herman Ullmann's Botticelli book, and it took me a long time to encode that data. Um, so I, re I revisited Kate Topham's presentation from last year's conference, um, where she grapples with similar thoughts, uh, and concludes that the visualization is not the answer. It's the question. Um, and I will also say that my aha moments come a lot from the point of creating and preparing the data. Um, so that's another kind of area of uh, fruitful uh, interaction. Um, and other takeaways, just that library metadata is really a key foundation for this kind of work. Um, and our data models can both be relied on and expanded by these kinds of projects. Uh, and small scale can still kind of give you some practice with tools you might use at a larger scale. And of course, communities of practice like this one that we're in right now um, are essential. All right, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Alex. Next up, we have Maria Lara's Flores uh, is a PhD candidate in Hispanic studies at Western University in Canada. Her research, in, her research interests are digital art history, material culture, and memorialization processes. Hi, I, let me just share my screen. Thank you. Can you see my screen? You can, right? Okay, so um, first of all, my um, I changed a little bit the title of my presentation because I uh, just uh, changed digital scarcity, scarcity to data scarcity <laughs> because I realized digital scarcity means another uh, completely different thing. So uh, what I'm gonna talk about now is um, like my... Um, um, thesis project for my PhD. Uh, I wanted to do social network analysis on colonial painters uh, from Mexico from 1680 to 1730. So I realized I needed a database. And then the thesis right now is focused on the creation of the database and not really the social network analysis because it was too much work, of course. Uh, so at the beginning, I started thinking about uh, how to build the database and how to um, uh, to be able to organize the information I needed to to gather the information the information uh, scattered in the historiography and organize that the data. Sorry. So I encountered what what one of the first problems that I encountered was data scarcity. So I started my um, thesis uh, proposal during the pandemic, the first months of the pandemic. So it was very hard to access uh, sources and resources for support. So I had to do this uh, like by myself <laughs> in lockdown. And this is, this is what I was able to do, right? So uh, there were other databases that I was trying to use to get the sources, to get the, the information from. The Mediateca is an online repository for um, Mexican museums. Memorica was in that time in their first years, and it's also a repository for uh, cultural objects in Mexico. And Arca it is an online database about colonial art in Latin America but none of them were really accessible. They didn't have enough information because most of the problems I was dealing with was the master's narrative, right? So only the most important painters, the ones that have been talked about all the time in, in Mexican art history, were the only ones that were showing up on searches and were the only ones showing up on databases and data sets. And I had like, well, my first list of painters that I had from that time. 
700 painters and only 40 were available, were showing on data sets or other databases. So I started creating the uh, database that was based on the prosopography. Um, and this is how I designed the database. Uh, it was based on five principles, the factoid model, the event-based conceptualization by CDOC CRM, a three-layer model of um, recording the data, uh, a diagram that I that I created after uh, one of uh, Gene Bauer's uh, suggestion, and the incorporation of linked open data. I'm only going to talk about the first one and the last one. So the factoid model basically uh, helps us to keep track of who sees. Uh, well, in this uh, in this image, uh, who, sees a, who sees a rabbit and who sees a dog, because that was very important to me, who was saying what in the historiography and when, of course. So, uh, for example, it's not the same to say Diego de Borgraf was born in 1652 than to say in 1934, Manuel Toussaint, one of the fathers, <laughs> founders of um art history in Mexico, he said that Diego de Borgraf was born in 1652. I wanted to keep that, ambi well, not um, that nuance in my in my data. Uh, so all my my three main entities in, in the database, which is a relational database, are um, artifacts, actors, and sources, and all of the tables link to the sources. I always keep... Um, uh, um, link to the sources. This is the, the final design, the final diagram of the database, which is very complex. So um, this is basically the, like the, the main idea. So entities have properties, data dictionaries describe these properties, and uh, entities participate in relationships. And these data dictionaries also describe these relationships, the entities and the properties. Uh, this is a more detailed diagram. So these are the three main entities, actors, artifacts, and sources. Um, and these uh, I separated. So other, other names, the case of the person is an event or like a, an accident of the person is not really an inherent property. Their occupations are also an accident, the life events. All of these are considered, well, events and in the CDOC CRM model. And then I also included these three tables with relationships. So, for example, to establish that a painter is the author that, that a painter is the author of a painting, I had to establish it through through here through actor act artifact relationships. So it was very very hard to to fill up the database. <laughs> So finally, uh, well, I decided to include some um, columns in my tables to be able to uh, link to other projects. Uh, so this is why uh, I used the linked open data principle. Um, so I started with the, with the actors. I used the virtual international authority file, the Gettys Union list of artist names, of course. And then I started using also Wikidata for actors and for also for uh, places, because I also have a, a table with life events with, for marriages, births and deaths, or places of work. And uh, for the artifacts, I used mainly the um, uh, information from Mediateca, but it was very, very scarce. It was very, well, it's, it is still incomplete. I also use the Getty vocabularies, for example, for technique. So here you can see I have a code for the technique, which in, uh, relates to uh, the Getty vocabularies in another table. I also wanted to establish if the, if the artwork was signed or if it was attributed to a painter from um, by an art historian, because it was also a uh, very important information for me. And uh, what else? Well, yeah, that's the that's the artifacts table. And well, uh, since 2020, when I started the, this project, uh, I realized that after the pandemic, all these access to information and the availability availability <laughs> sorry 
availability of collections has grown a lot. So uh, when I was preparing uh, the, this presentation, I went back to Wikidata and I started finding a lot of people that I couldn't find back in 2020. Uh, the um, ARCA website also has changed. It is, it is now accepting, uh, well, it is now open, so you can download all the, all the data. Then the UNAM, which is the national university in Mexico, is building an online list of colonial painters. It's in its first uh, stages, but it's very uh, useful for me. So I, now I need to add a new column <laughs> for the identifier of this list that's going to be uh, very important for the art historical, for the art historical field in Mexico. Then Memorica has also added to their collections. Also Mediateca has added more records, but only like pictures and pieces and uh, music, but not, not really painting collections. Also uh, Museo Nacional de Arte, who uh, they also have uh, colonial paintings in their collections and they have opened well, not really. They they only have shared their uh, collection online, but I don't think it's open to get the the data uh, because some of these um, websites. So, for example, Memorica, I just can't <laughs> understand how to download the 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 data from there, and also Museo Nacional de Arte. So, uh, I've been. Uh, trying to, as Alexandra said, with, with her project. It's an iterative project. I, I just, I'm just going in and out. I'm also using Open Refine and doing all this uh, data sets, mainly by hand. <laughs> now I have uh, approximately 2,400 actors in my database. Some of them are painters, some of them are other types of actors. And um, yeah, the relationships, well, the, the, the connections between them and the, the connections between the, the artifacts are like the last stage of my project, which is, which I'm trying to finish right now. So um, yeah, that's, that's basically the, like my project. And I would love if anyone has any uh, feedback or suggestions or tutorials or anything like that, that I can, that I can uh, watch or something. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria Laura. Um, okay. Next up is Barbara Romero Ferron, uh, Utrecht Uni University Library Researcher and Digital Humanities Specialist. Areas of expertise are complex cultural systems and network analysis. And this will be our last lightning talk, and then we will welcome questions and conversation after. Thank you. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Oh, slash. Okay. So thank you very much today. I'm going to be the one presenting, but I'm working in this project with my colleague, Lena Tull. So I think that this is a nice wrap up for the session of Lightning Talks, because what I'm going to talk about is building a framework for diverse ecologies, but mainly transforming research data into linked open data. So at the project that I'm working on is in a library. We have many, many, many like data sets that we storage as a library, a university library. And this is really interesting because we, I think that we are in the need to start working on that and a linked open data project was the, the perfect way of doing that. But why research data is that important? And it, I think that is because, you know, it supports open science and fair principles, but also enhance res research impact, impact, which is really interesting because you don't have to publish these data sets in, also, I mean, there is Zenodo and other platforms that you can do it and even journals, but, you know, if your, your university or library already does that for you, that would be also a great enhancement. Then for long-term preservation, because, you know, if it's an uh, institution, the one that curates how these data sets are preserved and also shared, would work better that when, for example, we have a lot of money from a research project and we created like a very fancy or nice website on visualization and then the website died when the money runs out, which is a 
something very common. And also because it facilitated interdisciplinary research, the availability of many types of research data, and helps with institutional memory, which is something that we like to tackle because it's kind of like, since when we are saving this data, how we can put it online and how we work with it. And personally, one of my main goals with this is prevent ecological impact because, you know, sometimes we think that we have to invent the wheel twice. And but if the data is shareable and, you know, like putting online through a public institution, as if it's like a university library, could be or any other type of archive institu archival institution. So that helps that the people don't have to do twice the same work. Um, so I'm going to talk about the idiosyncrasy because I understand that every single institution and university is quite different. But in the case of Utrecht University, we have a storage that we we manage that is is called Yoda, <laughs> and and we are the product owners of the library, but also like the university owns the the software so and develops it so we are able to actually you know work with that data easy that we we are paying a third party and uh, this is really interesting because here we have data not only from humanities that is my background but also for the background of my colleague lena that she's from geoscience and also from like medical data so we have many many different types of data also utrecht university uh, one of the the things that we have is that we share, we have to preserve the data from projects from 10 to 15 years. So it is the perfect space now that we promote the service, Yoda for researchers to be able to do something. But then you were wondering, okay, you have all the ingredients, like why you don't, what is the problem? It's not available. So the main problem is that Yoda is not a catalog. It's not like, you know, when you go and, find and look for, it's not, a book in a in like the library cut in a library catalog is it is not it's a storage works very well in collaborating and putting your data there but um it's, it's not that easy to share or to go through it and that is a problem that we have to solve last year the my institution started the linked open data project to start to create a knowledge graph with different with all the millions of data that we have not only as research data but also uh, in a special collections so i'm part of the data i'm one of the data architects with this project and the other one is my my colleague lena and what we decided to do is that okay we have millions of data but let's focus in research data what we do in research data we have many different fields we are like she's an expert in ontologies in, in geoscience i work with uh, our history and humanities in general but we don't know and, and we thought that this is like a very complex so what we created is this framework that we started working on it and it's still not finished part of it like put it in practice all the steps because it, this takes a while but this is i think that is a starting point and it's important so as all you know, the data life cycle. So the first thing that we have to do is to start tackling this storage and see what data can we share and, for, and then start not only uh, cleaning it, but also like, uh, like doing something with it, like creating an API or a CSV. That would be the easiest way. However, the part that we are like working on right now and that is I'm going to present is the data mapping and structure. Why? Because as a, as, an, as a person that really likes ontologies myself, I think that this is a very important part and it's the most difficult part if you want to work properly in linked open, with linked data. And um, so we started developing this framework. So first of all, we did a feasibility study that I can tell you is not going to be easy and it's not going to be done. And probably we are not going to see the end result of that. But I think that this is the perfect moment to start working on this framework. So first of all, we talked to researchers because we they one of the things that we encounter, we encounter is that they don't know what is the value of linked open data. So sometimes it's kind of, oh, OK, but we have to do all this work. But for what? Like what is going to retrieve to my research? And that was also interesting. Then one of our parts, and that is why we are focusing a lot in the mapping part in the ontologies, is the risk of missing knowledge. So if we use a very broad ontology that fits like a lot of type of data, but it's not field specific, we are missing a lot of layers of complexity that we don't want to miss. And, 
And then the other thing that we like that we have to handle, and this is something that is still uh, is not part of this framework, is where to how to storage the data, because Yoda is a relational database and it's not a triple store, and triple stores are quite expensive. So that's a thing that we have to also handle during that <laughs> in the future. But yeah, so. This research data and LOD framework, we base it in three pillars. First of all, is working groups. Second of all, knowledge design. And then we have the mapping sessions. So for the working groups, we work subject specific. We went to the different faculties and we were talking to data managers, uh, any other type of like uh, support staff, master coordinators, researchers. And then we wanted to focus in graduate and undergraduate students because we believe that uh, this is something that they, if they are interested in, too, they can include in their theses and or as a research project properly done. And that is the interesting part. So the idea is that they're creating a small working groups within each faculty, and then we can have that knowledge from them. The other section would be knowledge design. And this one is quite interesting because it's different depending on the, the faculty. There is, we discovered that there is like, well, we already knew that, but it was more clear that some of the faculties, they need more data literacy sessions, like more basic data cleaning, pre-processing uh, sessions. And others, they need more uh, like a whole emphasis in what is linked to open data, what is important and how. And then the most important one is sessions about ontologies and control vocabularies that we will be uh, creating. But there was there will be other people like also experts in, in, in each field uh, con like giving them. So the idea is that each of these groups will have later on will have mapping sessions. So they will have all these like teaching and hands-on sessions and sandbox for later on come to a few data sets that will give it to them based on their expertise. And then we started working in these data sets, mapping them with the ontologies and based on their field of expertise. And I, I know that I said a lot of expertise, but this is something extremely important if you want to do this properly and you want to put this data in the most, in the most truthful way. And last but not least, we wanted to focus too that I, we understand that probably there is a specific research project that they were they are more interested in the in some some kind of data or data sets. And then you have the creation of enrichment projects, but this is very subject specific. And if they want to go further and you know map more data or link that information to any other source, that would be great. But that would be something very like um, specific of each session. And then last but not least is collaboration. We reached different university libraries within the Netherlands and abroad that they are working in the same with the same issues to see if we can all collaborate together. Then other re, uh, also the research libraries and linked open data projects like who are community based working on this type of information, how we can link our data to their data, how we can make that connections. And in conclusion, we are now like trying to to, to map most of these, like the working groups and working on that. But we discovered, we knew that this is a lot of work, but this is a needed work. And I think that should be done also, not only researchers, but institutions. And this is something that like, I think that is very important that like that libraries or archives started to work on it, to put this data online in a different way. And this has to be together with community driven initiatives. So not only the institutions, but only talking to every field specific community to see how we can do that more cohesive. And yeah, that's it from our end. Thank you very much. All right, thanks so much. Okay, that concludes our lightning talks. We now have about 20 minutes um, or so for all sorts of questions and discussion. So hopefully you've been saving up some things to ask. If you'd like to, to ask them in the Slack, uh, in the Zoom channel or raise your hand here. I think there is one question from Alex uh, to Barbara. Have you explored Rowcrate and shared a link to Rowcrate um, in the Slack? Um, no, I, we didn't explore that. So I will check that out because we we 
the problem is also what we didn't even went further to see what softwares we can use because we want to make sure that is first like we make sense of the data because the university is quite special with privacy issues when we work with some software so i will check that out but thank you very much for the suggestion Great. I want to encourage anyone to ask questions for any of the lightning talks at this point. If you need a refresher, here's the link to the SCED page with um, the Lightning Talks. I think earlier in the Slack, Richard had asked for a link to the Tabernacle tool that Alex had mentioned. Uh, I will drop a link to that here. Oh yes, Barbara. I have a question for Fabio and Max. So I maybe I missed that, but like, why did you decide to call that the, the section of your ontology party? It's for dancing a specific, or it was in part. I don't. I'm not sure if I read it correctly. Hi, thank you for the question. So, um, in that case, uh, so party, you mean when we are um, making span categorization, the natural language processing task. In that case, we are using the overlapping categories to differentiate uh, precise two different things. First of all, we are exciting parties that can be individuals and groups. Then we have another category that is a person and another one that is group. So then we have two different categories applied to that part of text. One is party and the other can be group or person. Or if the model is on the side, just party. That's the, the reason why we have this uh, differentiation. Then inside a group, we can have multiple uh, parties, for example. We can overlap like uh, Legos and creating the notation for the event. Nope, that's clear. Thank you. Sarah and Jessica uh, in the Slack are saying, no questions, a lot of star eyes because of all the things I wanna look into after hearing these talks. And Jessica says, I agree. I can't wait to look at the presentations and deep dive on all the resources and workflows shared. Alex. Yeah, I had a question for Maria Laura. Um, I was wondering if you, well, I just want to talk more about your project together at some point, um, but uh, I was wondering like if you have explored visualization tools or um, kind of that, if that's entering into your project as well. Yeah, I, I wanted to, at first I wanted to use or to compare <laughs> Palladio and Gephi for uh, the visualization, but I ended up just using uh, Gephi for the network part of the of the project. And um, now that I'm like uh, that, I have the the network, and I don't know where to go from there. Uh, I'm thinking of adding also like because I was only um, anal analyzing the relationships between actors but now I think I can add sources to do like a historiographical analysis of how the master narrative was built right like the, the canonical artists so yeah only Gephi for the visualizations but I don't know I I I, I need to explore more yeah
Also, I'd like to say hi to Barbara because <laughs> we were <laughs> we were in the same cohort in the at back at Western. <laughs> Christine says that Maria Lara's cat is so, so cute. We do love a, an animal visitor. Great, we had five really excellent lightning talks just now. A lot of information packed into a short amount of time. So thank you to everyone for that. Alex has raised her hand. Do I have time for another question? Absolutely. Okay. Um, I Yeah, I was wondering, and this could be for any anybody else uh, on the panel, um, about like multilingual uh, sources and uh, metadata and like kind of how you're dealing with that. Um, I just, I didn't talk about it much, but I mean, for me, it's my project is a, just a, a bibliography, but I've got sources in French, um, and, uh, mostly French and English. Uh, so I have added like, you know, I've really taken advantage of Wikidata's multilingual kind of abilities there and added labels in different languages. But yeah, I was just curious how that comes up in your, in your projects. Sorry, <laughs> I was supposed to talk about that actually, but I just forgot. And um, yes, because my actors are like Mexican. Most of my sources are in Spanish, but most of the databases are in English and the the reference models are in English. So I've been kind of, I uh, did everything in English because my PhD, uh, well, I'm in Canada. So, but then I, <sighs> I started to think if I have, I should translate everything into Spanish or like what to do, what to do <laughs> in that case. So yeah, the wiki the Wikidata um, entries in different languages and also the Getty vocabularies and the union list are in different languages. But yeah, it's uh, it's uh, a great question. <laughs> I don't have the answer. 